Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're all very welcome to our webinar this morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to the third in our series of bioenergy uh, webinars from the Irish Bioenergy Association. This morning's webinar, um, we focus on the biodiesel and bioethanol sectors. And our title of the webinar is Biodiesel Reducing Transport Emissions. Just a small introduction about the Irish Bioenergy Association. We are the representative body for the bioenergy sector on the island of Ireland. That sec we cover the sectors of biomass, biogas, biofuels, energy crops and wood fuels. And we have a broad and growing membership across all sectors. Our work on behalf of members uh, through representation, lobbying, advocacy, networking, technical support, advice, knowledge and information sharing. And we are engaged in a number of research and development and demonstration projects including our European Innovation Partnership Project, Small Biogas Demo, our Interreg 3C project, our Biomass Installers and Designers Register, and the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme. We're open to new members, and if any of you would like to join us, uh, we'll be happy to discuss that with you further, and further information is available through our website. This morning's webinar is chaired by myself, Sean Finan, who I am the, the CEO of the Irish Bioenergy Association, and this morning's pres presenters are James Cogan, Policy Advisor at Ethanol Europe and Chair of the Arabia Transport Group, uh, Tony Hinbury, Director of Green Biofuels Ireland, and then after uh, the two presentations, we will have a panel discussion uh, with Q&A with the presenters, and also we will be joined by Noel Gavigan, who is the Arabia Technical Executive. Webinar attendees can submit questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we will endeavour to answer as many of your questions as possible. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I just want to uh, briefly discuss with you or, or outline to you a plan we have in the association to commission a report with support from industry partners and sponsors on Ireland's transport, energy and climate. The uh, Irish government and the programme for government contains very ambitious measures in the rollout of electric vehicles. We support as an organization the rollout of electric vehicles, but we hope that this report when uh, commissioned will focus on the mix of technologies required to reduce emissions from the transport sector up to 2030 with a view to 2040 and 2050. And if any of you or any attendees this morning would like to discuss how you can contribute uh, and assist us with this report, please do get in touch. Uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, James Cogan. James is um, the um, Policy Director with Ethanol Europe and also the Chair of the um, Tra Arabia Transport Committee. And I now hand over to James who will speak to you about bioethanol and give you an overview of the general policy landscape in Ireland with regard to uh, the whole biofuel sector. So Tony, or uh, James, I hand over to you. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me well there, Sean? Yes, indeed, James. Uh, take it away. All right. Thank you very much for that. And, and uh, thank you all for uh, logging in. Uh, I think we'd well over 100 registrations and there are uh, over 70 now online, which is a great turnout. So thank you. So I'm going to run you through quickly um, some uh, information on Ireland's kind of transport system right now and the statistics around it. Um, uh, then there'll be a fairly deep uh, dive into the policy context in which we are uh, and uh, how that matches or doesn't match uh, climate action aspirations in transport energy. Uh, and then something, uh, a section on uh, ethanol biofuel itself and where we are with that and what we can do. Uh, I work for uh, Ethanol Europe which is uh, commercially known as Pannonia Bio. It is a, an Irish-owned family business launched 10 years ago. Uh, that's it on the right-hand side of the screen there in the photograph. Uh, right now, we're making over 500 million litres of bioethanol per year and over 350,000 tonnes of various quality animal feeds. Our ethanol output equates to about 10% of Europe's overall ethanol production. Uh, we've over 250 people working in the organization, supporting well over 2,000 jobs in the region. 
Uh, it's an inspiring hub of new green products, processes, investments, and growth. And, uh, you know, if you look at the photograph there, uh, uh, none of that was there before the launch. Uh, a th about a third of the equipment you see in that wasn't there three years ago. And even since the photograph has t been taken, there's been uh, more work done. And I'd say, you know, that's what a, a decarbonized, it, that's what the engine of a decarbonized green, econ green economy looks like. Uh, it's a very clean uh, ecological uh, process. Uh, there are no emissions coming out of the, the place. It's, uh, it's essentially a, uh, an organic GMO free uh, uh, place uh, to produce energy uh, and feed and uh, bioproducts. Uh, there's also solar and wind energy going on around the, uh, around the organization. Uh, and there's a number of very exciting new um, uh, feed and materials projects going. Definitely encourage anybody to visit if they like. Ethanol itself, which is the core of the thing, is made by fermenting uh, tillage crops. In our case, it's grain uh, into alcohol using a, a centuries-old technique, but a very modern state-of-the-art technology. In terms of transport energy generally and its relation to climate uh, change, well, transport accounts for 40% of energy-related carbon emissions, so that's excluding uh, agri emissions. Uh, that is rising between 1% and 3% per year, and that's a really, really rocks-hard uh, trend. It's been going on like that for many decades. Uh, it's the same uh, in the UK, in Europe, and it's even higher uh, in other places around the world. There's no reversal of that trend in sight, so you'll get the odd dip uh, relating to economic activity like the 2008 crash and COVID, but uh, uh, smoothen out or, or factor out those economic changes and that rise uh, continues. EV uptake is still way lower than imagined, uh, so there's a huge gap between what we all hope and imagine and what's actually happening on the ground. All of the climate progress, and I say all, I mean to all practical purposes, all climate progress made in transport to date in Europe and in the world is actually biofuels. Uh, so that's mostly ethanol on a worldwide scale, uh, with biodiesel being a very big factor in Europe and in Ireland. So, uh, you know, in that context, the new government is in a humongous quandary in terms of how it's going to reverse that, stop the trend and then reverse it. Um, Ireland's transport energy is all oil, to all practical purposes. Uh, the graph you see is directly from the most recent uh, Department of Transport bulletin on our fleet. Uh, fleet growth in 2019 alone, uh, growth alone was over 88,000 vehicles, so there are 88,117 extra vehicles on the road compared to 2018. So the total number is just over 2.8 million. Uh, the EV fleet growth was uh, uh, 4,300. Uh, so for every um, uh, 19 new diesel and petrol vehicles hitting the road, there's one electric uh, vehicle, which means that even if we were to throw all of the current stock of vehicles into the sea, um, we would still have a heck of a lot more diesel and petrols in the fleet in 10 years' time than electrics. I'm not celebrating that. It's just a hard fact that we and uh, Irish policymakers have to grapple with. On current trend, uh, the diesel petrol fleet is on track to grow another, by another 500,000 units by 2030 to about 3.3 million. That number could be matched by a similar uh, uh, volume of electric vehicles, assuming electric vehicle sales kind of doubled every year between now and then, doubled within uh, the constraints of uh, how many vehicles one can actually physically sell in a year in Ireland. In terms of uh, climate uh, action generally in Europe, uh, Ireland was, uh, uh, like the rest of Europe, was aiming, and I uh, say aiming uh, in inverted commas, for 30% cuts by 2030. So that's uh, aiming up on, you know, over the last decade, that was the, uh, the figure uh, shared generally across Europe. 30% cuts in emissions by 2030 compared to 2005. 2005, as far as Ireland uh, transport energy concerned, is roughly similar to 2020. So we're looking for that level of cuts compared to, 2000 to, to today. Uh, however, the most recent European law 
uh, now demands 40% cuts by 2030 compared to 1990, which is a different baseline. If you uh, look at transport alone, isolate transport alone, that's 80% uh, cuts in transport compared to 2020. The Green Deal under the new European Commissioner, Ursula von der Leyen, aims to increase this to 50 or 55%. And that's very popular in Europe and compared to 1990, which in transport terms in Ireland would be 88% compared to today, which is phenomenal. Uh, overall, across the economy, the Green Deal uh, would uh, require countries to cut over 7% per year. Uh, which is what is in our, the new government's uh, program for government. So as you can imagine, some major uh, wartime or COVID-like measures are going to be needed uh, for that to happen. So in terms of current, current policy measures, so what's already to get the kind of policy boots on the ground, are they up to that job in any way at all? Well, we have uh, the main piece of European legislation is the Renewable Energy Directive, which demands 10% renewables in transport by this year and 14% by 2030. But if you take out uh, the things that countries don't have to do, so a lot of it, that is not mandatory, so even the 14% by 2030, only half of that is mandatory. Uh, take out the non-mandatory half, which Ireland has actually done. Uh, we, most of the non-mandatory half, Ireland is, has not signed up to yet. Take out a, an accounting kind of trick called multiple counting and factor in the amazing laxness in the European Commission's uh, policing of the whole thing. And we get to about a third of that in real terms or perhaps even less. So the Renewable Energy Director's very, uh, Directive is, is very small potatoes in terms of the, uh, the goal uh, that we have in front of us. The Directive is essentially going to be redundant and it'll be rewritten or, or uh, superseded by much bigger things. Ireland has uh, translated that directive into uh, a couple of things on the ground here, the Biofuels Obligation Scheme and the SEI grants for electric vehicles. So what we have to date is 5% ethanol, 7% biodiesel, and about 16,000 electric vehicles and plug-in electric vehicles. In terms of renewables, we're at around 3.3% in real terms. Uh, virtually all of that is the ethanol and biodiesel part of it, uh, because the electric vehicle uh, quota is actually so small compared to the 2.8 million vehicles in the fleet. Uh, 10 years progress undone by one year's growth, that's an understatement. Uh, Ireland is a laggard, well, yes, that's true, uh, but uh, not a hell of a lot of difference uh, to many other countries. Um, Ireland and Germany were uh, interesting in that we both waited until very recently. Well, Ireland hasn't done it yet, uh, but Germany has just published its National Energy and Climate Plan uh, to the European Commission. And I had a look at that during the week. And uh, there's a lot of parallels between uh, the German situation and ours in terms of the measures being proposed for the ne next 10 years not matching in any way uh, the scale of the problem. Um, Ireland generally uh, in transport, uh, energy and climate action, I think probably most people on this call would have a feeling for this. Uh, we don't have a target for 2030 in transport uh, in terms of uh, carbon emissions cuts or oil consumption cuts, which is pretty much the same thing. Um, we don't have an analysis or plan for the emissions cuts in transport. And as I was saying, that's pretty much the same uh, as in Germany and many other countries. The proposed 1 million EVs goal for 2030 seems to have dropped from the program, been dropped from the program for government, uh, though we still have the proposed ban on diesel and petrol car sales, and that's been even strengthened to include unequivocally uh, imports. So that is definitely a very strong signal. Uh, but in terms of analysis behind that, so is it feasible? Is, would it, is it effective? Like what would it result in, in terms of cuts by 2030? Uh, and in it's possible to say that it could result in uh, zero cuts by 2030 or even an increase in carbon emissions and transport as per the current trajectory ban in. What would it cost if such a thing was done? Who would pay? So there are very many unknowns still. The 7% annual cuts target could be so ambitious as to not be taken seriously in many quarters. And that's not a, an outlandish thing to say, as we have had a very ambitious uh, pronouncements made over the last 10 years that have not been followed up on it with policy action. Uh, so there is skepticism around it. 
But if it's taken seriously, then it's actually very good for biofuels because 7% annual cuts focuses people's minds on getting things done quite soon. And that means they'll look at everything. Uh, there will be a desperate search for things that are, can be done in the short term that are cost effective, that are uh, effective in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, the UN, United, the United Nations uh, uh, panel on climate change points to a 15% biofuels rule in transport. So that's about five times what we have currently in Ireland. Um, biofuels could be doubled soon in Ireland and doubled, that's very soon, uh, achieving transport emissions cuts of three to four percent, which is modest enough, but it's actually bigger than anything else that's being proposed right now. It's also very low cost, very quick and effective. So that comes down, uh, brings us to us. Uh, so uh, ethanol uh, is a substitute for petrol. E10 petrol is petrol with ethanol blended into it uh, to 10%. Um, so uh, we in Ireland already have uh, E5 petrol, which is ethanol blended into it at 5%. And all of the petrol uh, in Ireland's 100, 1 million uh, petrol cars. That's been the case for over 10 years. Uh, so that's the E5 sticker you see on all petrol pump nozzles. Uh, the US, France, Germany, Netherlands, Finland, Hungary, Belgium, and a whole bunch of others are on E10 petrol for a number of years already. Uh, France already has E85 available at a third and growing uh, of its uh, petrol station network. Uh, Brazil is at an, on an average of 27% ethanol, but higher, uh, much higher in uh, big chunks of the fleet. So Ireland's E10 is to, Ireland's E5 currently is uh, the equivalent to, you know, you still using an old Ericsson phone compared to the very first iPhone. It's a, uh, really a thing that we should have done quite a while ago. We could switch to E10 overnight. It, uh, there's no cost in it for the consumer or the extractor. Uh, compare that, and it's not saying it's an alternative to, but it's in, it's a, in addition to electri uh, electrification, uh, compared the new cost to the consumer sector of E10 to the 10,000 euros per vehicle uh, government support for electric vehicles, and that's huge because um, 100,000 electric vehicles would come to a billion, and a million electric vehicles would come to 10 billion. The carbon emissions reductions uh, in, in using ethanol energy as opposed to oil energy is 72%, uh, and that's rising a percent or so each year. Uh, so there's no question that in 10 years time that 72% will be uh, over 80%. Uh, E10 petrol in Ireland uh, brings the same uh, carbon emissions reductions as say having 100,000 EVs, plug-in EVs, or it's the same as having just simply uh, 50 or 60,000 less cars on the road. Uh, and that's all for pretty well zero investment. So how good is E10 uh, as a, a fuel and as a climate action? Well, every 1% increase in blend by volume cuts emissions by uh, around 0.6% in uh, the vehicles that use it or in the fleets that use it. It also, and there's a bunch of very um, attractive uh, parallel benefits that would be strong enough on their own to warrant the introduction, uh, notably the reduction in tailpipe particulates emissions and NOx emissions. Uh, the reductions are phenomenal. Um, E10 doesn't, uh, contrary to, uh, to uh, you know, perceptions of once upon a time, it uh, doesn't reduce fuel efficiency because E10 is a, ethanol is an oxygenate, which means that it makes the petrol burn uh, cleaner and more efficiently. So even though there's a slightly lower energy density in, in ethanol, it makes all of the petrol uh, uh, burn better. Um, Compared to the USA, our, uh, Europe uses a lot more chemical additives in the petrol called aromatics. Uh, the USA has been working to get them out, a bit like they got lead out as well uh, uh, before anybody else. Um, once you, if you put more ethanol in, you, you need less of these chemical additives. Um, in terms of the agri-economy, uh, E10 is a terrific boost for demand for EU tillage crops. I mean, uh, by, uh, domestic European uh, biofuels bring about uh, 6 billion euros in demand for tillage crops in Europe, which is somewhere around 12 or 15 percent the, the cost of the CAP program, to put that in perspective. 
Um, it also is the virtually the only thing that helps Europe reduce imports of GMO soy meal from the Americas because the co-product of ethanol is a high quality protein feed meal. Also, as we discovered, everybody's discovered in the last few months, ethanol makes a great uh, sanitizer and uh, we have been producing uh, an awful lot of that. So ethanol is not just for the climate, uh, great for the climate, it's actually a, a terrific uh, product all around. Introducing E10 petrol. Um, oh, I've just gone the wrong direction. Any downsides to ethanol? There, is, there are none at all. Uh, there, it's a peace of mind solution on all fronts. Demand has grown uh, sixfold in the world since 2000. Uh, there were concerns. People always have concerns about new things. Uh, they're well documented. They have been uh, debated at great length. But any of the concerns that people have had 10 to 20 years ago have been shown to be unfounded. And all of the evidence, the empirical, massive uh, empirical evidence is there to show that. E10 is a, simply a better fuel for vehicles. Working well in petrol vehicles of all makes, models, and ages. And you can see that in the 500 million vehicles around the world that are using them. Um, most of them in regions where you cannot buy petrol with anything less than 10% ethanol in it. So people aren't even aware uh, that they have it in it, no matter the make, model, or age of their vehicle. All EU ethanol came into production in a period of improving yields, uh, reducing farmland area, increasing woodland area, reducing crop prices, crop prices and improving uh, food security. So uh, you know, Europe is a great place to produce ethanol and it can do it in a highly sustainable, environmentally friendly way uh, that allows all of the other um, uh, uh, ambitions for improvement of the quality of the environment and the quality of, the, uh, uh, of the cl improving the climate and the quality of the, the world we live in. It, it is uh, feasible to increase ethanol production and achieve those other gains. And the GHG savings of ethanol are getting better every year. So, I mean, we have just huge investments going on uh, uh, right now, but all the time, which uh, translate to a much more energy efficient and process efficient way, ways of producing the stuff. So messages for our new government, um, generally speaking, uh, in transport. Well, first of all, you know, very top down, uh, that one to 3% increase every year will translate into a 10 to 25% increase by 2030, depending on economic growth. So we're in a very deep hole and it's getting deeper. And the first thing you do is stop digging. So could we cap transport oil use right now? Uh, that should be a Europe-wide goal. Can't understand why it isn't. And um, so we're, we've got rhetoric talking about reducing, but in the real world, everything is increasing. Uh, the regulatory quality deficit in Brussels means that member states need to learn to legislate for bioenergy themselves. Well, not just bioenergy, but also transport, uh, climate and energy action. Uh, as we've seen from the Renewable Energy Directive and the absence of anything else coming out in the transport energy space, um, uh, everybody has spotted this gap and all of the countries are having to come up with their own plans. Uh, the Netherlands, for instance, wrote, the Netherlands government wrote to its parliament last week to say that it was taking matters into its own hands and it was reaching out to a number of other countries to come up with a uh, program that it, it can implement to improve its regulation of transport energy. Um, in terms of bioenergy, biofuels specifically, uh, we need to take ownership of our biofuels sustainability. That's also part of the regulatory quality de deficit in Brussels. Um, we need to uh, become masters of uh, the whole theme of the different forms of biofuels and bioenergy and decide for ourselves what we think is good and what isn't. Uh, we have the leg legislative or regulatory um, powers to do so. A uh, big hint in this is that uh, Europe uses quite a, or Ireland and Europe uses quite a lot of uh, imp uh, biofuels that are imported from outside Europe where uh, traceability is uh, less certain and where we can't enforce higher standards that we have in Europe. Uh, so that is one area that will definitely be uh, coming out of the spotlight in the next couple of years. In terms of uh, you know, humdrum uh, fiscal measures, we have energy taxation in Europe, uh, which was established in a directive dating back to 2003, when leaded petrol was still around, before climate had become an issue. Uh, and, uh, uh, renewable fuels were taxed more, uh, the same or more than uh, oil, according to that directive, and that's still the case. And, and a very urgent thing is for that energy taxation directive to be reformed. The reform has been written, and um, I would urge Ireland to go to Brussels and ask Brussels to put it to the vote. And of course, introduce E10 
petrol this year. Thank you very much. And I would really encourage anybody to contact me if you'd like a visit to the plant. Thank okay, you. thanks very much, James. And um, thanks for your presentation. And indeed, thanks, uh, uh, it's not your a valued member of the Irish Bioenergy Association and it was it was great to see your plant last January and the great work that's been done there and it's really a true example of the whole bioeconomy and uh, the value that can be got from a wide variety of uh, different uh, products produced from one raw material. Um, our next uh, speaker um, is Tony. So while Tony is just getting set up there, um, I'd just like to mention that this morning's webinar focuses on the biofuels, ethanol, bioethanol and biodiesel, um, but obviously biomethane also plays a, or can play a significant role in terms of <clears throat> the biofuels mix, but we will address that topic in a separate uh, webinar. Um, so our next speaker is Tony Hinbury. Tony is Director at Green Biofuels Ireland, and Green Biofuels Ireland are based in County Wexford and founded in 2004. And, um, I'd like to now hand over to Tony, who will take you through his presentation. Thank you, Tony. Thanks a million, Sean. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, our panelists, I think, have reached over 80 at this moment. So, and I appreciate that there's people joining us right across Europe. Uh, so really reflective of our, of our European membership. So we welcome everyone, obviously, today. Uh, just in relation to green biofuels, I suppose I'm going to give a big, bit of a background of green biofuels and a background to uh, what we do and where we came out of, I suppose. Green Biofuels came about into production in 2008 in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. So the picture in the bottom right hand side of that slide is, is a picture of our facility. We're a 30,000 ton facility and we, we go beyond our production capacity up to 36,000 tons. Uh, we've been in production for 12 years and uh, we're situated with an air court in Ireland of Y21KW2. If you want to have a closer look or a Google map look at ourselves, we have a website, gbi.ie, that can explain more detail of our products and our product specs, etc. Uh, I suppose overall, I take a holistic view to uh, solving our problems from the point of view of solving climate change is complex and there's no one set answer. And I acknowledge that, and I know our government and in Europe and with the Renewable Energy Directive, both the first directive and the second directive, are quite challenging documents to get across all member states uh, and to get agreement across member states. But we have what we have, and we are in the thick of uh, the European uh, the Renewable Energy Directive too. So we are in favor of, obviously, ethanol, and we're in favor of, of a blend rate higher than what it currently is, and similarly of bio. We would have found the department quite progressive with their briefing sessions with us. They're doing the best that they can in, in, in the environment. And Ireland is a leader uh, from the point of view of, uh, of mandates up to uh, B11 for biodiesel blending. So that's just a little bit of uh, background there of that. Overall, a production process, uh, a production process, we mainly, we make all our product from wastes. Waste animal fat or waste used cooking oil. All, we source all that on the Ireland of Ireland, north and south. Uh, and we've done that historically from day one to to date. Uh, so our feedstocks are predominantly category one tallow animal fat wastes, UCO, and then it goes through a chemical process. This process is underwritten in law uh, in how it's handled under animal byproducts legislation, two pieces of, of acts, uh, animal byproduct legislation, ABP, uh, 1069-2009 and 142-2011, that stipulates how you can process a category one tallow into biodiesel. Our, our sustainability is greater than 85%. So for every 1% use of ours, you'll have greater than 0.85. For every 1%, you'll have greater than 85% better than diesel. So biodiesel and used coconut oil would be similar in that regard. And our byproducts, so biodiesel is about over 94% of the product, but we produce glycerin. Now our glycerin can't go into hand sanitizers because it's an animal fat in origin. So our glycerin goes into biogas, into the grid on the island of Ireland as well. Well, a substantial amount goes to Northern Ireland because they have no more biogas plants. But recently we found out it's in the Republic of Ireland. So it's a real green circular economy. Our, our biodiesel is all sold on the island of Ireland. The feedstocks are all from the island of Ireland. The glycerin goes to ABP on the island of Ireland. Our fertilizer goes to France because it's powdered, it's not pelletized. Our wastewater goes also to ABP, into ABP biogas. And our, even our distillation side product goes into burning in tallow factories. So uh, it's, 
it's a nice, clean, simple solution. Overall, green biofuels went with the advanced second generation technology. Uh, there was a temptation issue to look at rapeseed because at the time on the mineral oil tax relief scheme, prior to the introduction of the biofuel obligation scheme, by the then minister in 2010 was Minister Eamon Ryan, and he's back again uh, into a similar department. But at that time, he brought in an act uh, to mandate the use of biofuel in general. And that act was pushed on over several governments. So it's got agreement from, from various parties throughout the decades since. Uh, and I suppose he was the most progressive minister to bring in the biofuel obligation scheme. And then of implementers, the best implementer was Alex White that brought it from 8% to 11%. It's the largest increase at that time. So our technology, we've outsourced the, the supply of that from BDI, Biodiesel International. They have in excess of 40 plants across four continents. And from their perspective, uh, an international well-known uh, setup and says what it can do on the tin from the point of view of sustainability. Multi-feed stocks, uh, from that point of view, it is a multi-feed stocks, but from our point of view in Ireland, it's used cooking oil and tallow. I suppose setting up a biodiesel plant in Ireland isn't without its complications, and I suppose I'm trying to give the that genuine producers of this product and GBI are members of the European Biodiesel Board and GBI is a member of the European Waste and Advanced Biofuels Association. Of those genuine members, you'll always get rogue participants and that's been alluded to by James Coogan and his participants. But for those who are genuinely in this game, uh, they, we will have various uh, regulations, various licensing, various audits. So for example, there, the Department of Agriculture will come into us twice a year or more with spot audits from the point of view of Category 1. From the point of view of UCO, the EPA will, will follow that through. Uh, from the point of view of the biofuel obligation scheme, we're an account holder. Various verifications and practically annual audits from the subsection of the DCCAE, the Climate Communication, Climate Action and Renewable and uh, Environment. Uh, we've just emissions license. Dublin City Council monitor the ins and outs of all used cooking oil into our facility, transfrontier shipments. We're there's an ISCC certification from the point of view of our certification across Europe. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but there's a website there, I'll show you the link to that. And that will fall into my discussion on Renewable Energy Directive 2 and where that goes. Health and safety, obviously, is a key factor with a plant when you're into a small element of a very small biorefinery of what we are. Uh, we've reached various international standards and obviously we're fully uh, customs compliant. Overall, I spoke about tallow. Tallow, we're over 90% tallow feedstocks to 95% tallow feedstocks in our plant. We use, only use coconut oil from the island of Ireland. The sustainability we've spoken about, and that arguably we would vouch ourselves as being the most climate friendly because we're sourcing the product on the island and we're selling to the island and we're doing the same with our byproducts. So from that point of view, we would see ourselves as, as top, top of class in regards to that. Greenhouse gas default savings, from that point of view, uh, are at in excess of 84%. So from the point of view of credibility and visibility on what we do, uh, over the years, Ireland uh, have various um, certificates. Uh, this slide, we have a recent certificate uh, that's valid until June 2020, but that just gives an outline. With that website, you can look at all producers, what they're producing, and the collectors. The suppliers into us, we can look at those and vouch that they've been audited by an international organization to assure ourselves of uh, to assure ourselves that the product is sustainable and coming from the right sources. Overall, we've looked at various uh, certs of whether it's your cash one tallow, whether your energy, whether your fry light, we'd look at other ICC certs on that particular slide. So advanced biofuels, there uh, there's many categories of both uh, first generation and biofuels advanced is split into two sections, uh, both into category one and use coconut oil and others that have to come online, have to come on stream. But in Ireland, those are the five that uh, have achieved that status. And then first generation uh, is there in the mix also. Our process overall is a continuous batch process. Uh, we've over 30 tests for every single batch. The body is washed and purified and the water is recycled and we, we have a, a, a water attenuation tank. We collect our own rainwater and use that in our process to, to ensure that we're um, as renewable, as conscious of the natural resources we use in, in our everyday life. 
uh, from the point of view of our distilled product, it meets the European certification as well under EN 14214 that overall stipulates what our biodiesel contains and what are the major factors. And this is just a small extract of it. Ester content is an important spec to reach. I have industry ad industries to the averages to the right, green biofuels out are in the middle and then the specifications and where we see ourselves on ester content and monoglycerides. I won't go into too much detail, it's on our website, but I will talk a little bit more about monoglycerides and ester contents in uh, the slides coming up. I suppose overall the issues that were portrayed with biodiesel are renewable fuels, they talk about filter blocking tests. What is your filter blocking test? What are the results? UK specification could up as 2.5 filter blocking. Typically, a distilled product, when you buy a distilled product, will have 1%. So, you know, the onus is on people to ensure they're buying the right products with the right key quality indicators to ensure they're getting that. We talk about typical factors on cold flow properties. So, a tallow metal ester, which we predominantly produce, will have a cold flow factor of 10 to 14. So, at those temperatures, this will start to melt. UCO will have a lower factor. And the EN590 determines how much and what temperatures the overall blended product of, whether it's a TME or UCOME, is in diesel. And that's where the distributor or the refiner has to ensure that they're buying the correct diesel to match with the particular products that they're buying. Overall, we look at saturated monoglycerides, which is a very important indicator for us. The European spec is 55. And if you have higher than that, it will cause filter problems. And this did occur in the UK when it's not a distilled product and doesn't hit the new methods of testing. And when I look at typical examples of biodiesel, you can go out and buy what you consider a low filter blocking number. You could buy a low cold flow filter blocking. But the monoglycerides can be a high level and might necessarily be distilled and technically would far exceed the 55 minimum and will be at 88% uh, SMG index of 88. So that 88 would throw it out of spec. But then you could take a biodiesel with low monoglycerides of 0 0.1 as in green biofuels, a higher cloud point up to very high cloud points, but even at those cloud points would still be within, well within the SMG index. So overall, when buying the product, the distributors and refiners are very astute to knowing what's involved in that process. Um, overall, we look at biological contamination on the product when, when looking at biodiesel and any, any biofuels that obviously water, low, low water is important to avoid bi biological growth. We get our tanks independently tested and we ensure there's no movement by shipping because we buy it all on the island and sell to the island. So that reduces that issue in respect of, um, in respect of water or any contaminant problems. Um, overall, I suppose Green Biofuels is supportive of the, of the Renewable Energy Directive. We look forward to see what this new government brings forward. Uh, with its challenges of three parties mixed together. When we look at the program from government, we see it, it's, it's aspirational document. It can be a little bit qualitative, but we certainly look forward to the first 100 days in office. I look forward to the July stimulus package that's, that's in the document. I suppose when we are eight days into July, we certainly look forward to see what comes out of that. But that's just a brief summary of what we do. As I said, Green Biofuels, GBI.ie, has some uh, information there if you require any more. Appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much, Tony, for your presentation. And um, we'll now proceed to our questions and answers and, and panel discussion. And um, so if any uh, attendees this morning have questions, we have quite a number of questions have come through the Q&A tab. So please uh, keep them coming along through the Q&A tab and we'll endeavor to address as many of the questions that you raise as possible. Um, so <clears throat> if we can just make all the guys live on the screen. So we just need to unmute everyone and Tony needs to be unmuted. Okay, so I think we have everyone. So um, the first question, um, I'll open it up here. Um, what are your views on the potential use of lignol, 
would he buy him as raw material for production of biofuels? So um, maybe James or Tony or even Noel want to come in on that one as an opening question from Eugene. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm happy to take that. Yes, to, uh, James, yeah. So uh, for the benefit of everybody else, lignocellulosic biofuels um, are, are a form of, they're ethanol, again, it's ethanol, but instead of being made from the sugar, the starch of tillage crops, uh, it comes from uh, the, the woody parts of crops, so woody parts of leaves and stems and residues for the most part. Uh, so it's a very uh, process intensive process for uh, producing ethanol. Um, it's part of what's called the second generation of biofuels. Uh, so most biofuels today, the vast majority are made from, you know, just crops, from uh, uh, rapeseed oil, from used cooking oil, and from tallow, as in the case of Green Biofuels Ireland. And second generation then go on and talk about, uh, aim to produce them from, from the hard to uh, process uh, materials that are typically seen as wastes or residues. Um, lignocellulosic, well, <clears throat> the European Commission has spent 500 million euros in a direct grant aid project to make them possible. And a bunch of uh, private companies have spent that, uh, you know, several billion euros building plants to actually do it. Uh, the European Commission has also set a 3.5% mandate for them, uh, so an obligation on member states to use them by 2030. At the moment, uh, there's virtually none in existence and none being made. So it's a question of uh, there being, uh, of that being a future solution to a today's problem. So very welcome when it comes, but I'd be wary of trying to solve today's problems with future solutions. Uh, there are, uh, w with the mandate that the European Commission has convinced the uh, member states to vote for in the Renewable Energy Directive, one would expect there to be about 100 factories built uh, in the next 10 years to produce it. Uh, at the moment, nobody's building a factory except for uh, one factory being built, mostly funded by the European Commission itself. So it's not looking good for it. Um, I wouldn't bet the farm on it, that's what I'm saying. Okay, just a follow-on question, uh, James, here from Brian. Um, Brian says that, uh, thanks you for your presentation, the previous government did not listen to this opportunity, and hopefully the current Green government will listen and act. The absence of Irish policy means that we will continue to serve a growing biofuels market by importing biofuels and the challenge is how do we get more Irish economy to supply this growing market. So if you could just comment on that and then I'll hand over to Tony for the next question. Well, uh, certainly, I mean, Green Biofuels Ireland is a, an absolute joining example of how you can make biofuels uh, nationally. And uh, we can, Ireland has huge potential for, for producing more bioenergy generally, especially in the area of gas. In terms of making um, uh, uh, biofuels generally, you're competing, always competing with oil. And that makes cost the number one factor. And cost means scale. And Ireland isn't a scaly kind of place uh, in many respects. So it's, uh, we're always gonna have to bear in mind that we're part of the European Union and leverage that as our way of um, driving up bioenergy use. That's not to say that there isn't a huge amount of scale, on tap scale in Ireland, but that's probably as much in, the, in biodiesel as in biogas uh, rather than ethanol itself. We, I mean, if we were to restart the sugar industry, you could get one decent sized ethanol plant out of that, that's for sure. Uh, but that's, you know, um, well, that's a complex discussion. Okay, um, just moving on to, uh, to Tony, just a question here from Connor. Um, with regard to diesel and jet fuel, um, is there any future prospects for um, HVO production in Ireland? So maybe, Tony, if you could comment on that in terms no, of... No, that's, that's A1. I suppose overall, uh, it's back, I suppose, to James' previous comment about scale. There's only a certain amount you can scale up in Ireland. We are a small uh, economy, a small number of people. It, it's easier when we look at HVO production in general, Nestle would have a large plant in Finland, there's a large plant in Total, there's large plants out there that are drawing. We do contribute, by the way, to HVO production, but just not in Ireland. We send all our animal fat, the category tree animal fat, out to Finland where they take it and turn it into HVO production. So Ireland is a contributor, but in this country, the scale isn't possible. You think of one million production. Uh, so from that point of view, HVO 
production, uh, its possibility of happening in Ireland is extremely limited at this stage. And that's why we always go back to when we start our factory here, we see the availability. There's about up to maybe 50,000 tonnes of tallow category one in Ireland. And there's availability of up to 20,000 tonnes of UCO. That's the market. That's the full market. And even that UCO, which is mainly collected by Frylight, by, uh, by the Goodman companies, that will be sent to his factories in the UK. So I think what Ireland has to be careful about is the sustainability of what wastes we have, and then we can transfer those wastes into energy rather than take the likes of our, our, our tallow, our animal, our, our animal oils, and just send them abroad, abroad to HBO production. I think we need to relook at how, how do we use that in Ireland and how can the government support that legislation. We still have some carbon savings using category three graded tallow. It might have 85% what we like, but it could be as good as the 60% or the 50% of the first generation fuels. So there's definitely options there in creativity. And while I welcome the program's government, uh, the program for our government, I would say what's missing there is, like, well, it's all great to say, we take away diesel, we take away petrol in 2030. And there's a lot of a stick approach rather than, well, how are we going to do it? Just break down that into bite-sized pieces in the first 100 days. What legislation are you going to put in place? And what are you going to do to take these streams that we have rather than have foreign companies take them over and use them for their own production? Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, just um, Robert um, I, is looking for samples and a price of glycerin. So I'll make an introduction, Robert, to you after um, by email to Tony so we can maybe can discuss that uh, separately offline. Um, going over to Noel, um, just uh, David here has a query or question about the home heating sector to replace kerosene. Should home heating be subject to the biofuels obligation scheme? Um, and I'll also ask the question to maybe Tony uh, on his views as a as a supplier of biofuels. So maybe over to you, Noel. Just a quick, what's your thoughts on that that topic? Yeah, well, it's technically it, it's very possible. Um, we use quite a lot of kerosene uh, in this country, and it's one of the issues that we've really addressed, or we really need to address, is that a huge amount of our housing stock is reliant on kerosene, and the best methods to change over that, obviously you could um, start conversion overnight by putting in um, different you know, blends in, into the kerosene. Um, there's a cost factor there as well, obviously kerosene is quite a, a relatively cheap product um, compared to the road fuels, um, largely due to the taxation. And you know a lot of the incentive in the past has been by using the taxation to, to assist in, in allowing biofuels in or using the obligation systems. Now you could put an obligation system in for kerosene um, that without a doubt the equipment is well able to handle it and um, there is a slight issue with putting um, material that's from an organic source into long-term storage in, in tanks around the country outside people's houses you could have a slight difficulty there to put in high levels because being biological it could be subject to biological degradation over time so there's a slight issue there but technically it's very possible um, but there's also a big, que big question in whether we want to look at our housing stock and look at other methods of decarbonizing heat and um, but as a as a stop gap it is definitely something that could be uh, considered in the mix okay thanks Noel just a follow-on question and I come back to um, Tony on this question as well about the, the the kerosene but just also Tony if you could address uh, just a question here from David about just issues regarding um, in in 2019 around blocking filters and uh, if, if that has been addressed, um, and maybe you could just comment about um, maybe one or some of the quality yeah. issues that you come across in the whole in the sector. So, and also maybe address the topic of the biofuels as a supplier of home heating uh, can, it be, can it replace kerosene. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I suppose overall, uh, when I look at Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland does have biofuel and bioheating oil. We supply to a Northern Ireland distributor and already there's a mandate for bio in kerosene in the north. And while we all experienced COVID and we're all heavily challenged in that period, what we found our demand in Ireland actually with, with the mandates going up there and the distributor able to blend it off, that took away some of the surplus product we had. Also, in relation to that, we found our existing, some of our customers in Ireland had challenges getting product and then took our product in lieu of that. So Northern Ireland has already addressed it because Northern Ireland has it in Agri, has it in home heating and has it on the road, inland waterways, etc. In relation to quality, I touched on that in the presentation lightly. 
But what, what we're getting at there is, is always that case, when I buy anything, buyer beware. There is an element of due diligence that we all have to carry out. So you've got to know your product, you've got to know what you're buying, and you have to know the key. It's not one answer, like I was talking about CFPP. One number doesn't do it all. You have to drill into the detail, you have to ask the questions, is this build, what's the uh, monoglyceride level, what's the saturated monoglyceride level? And once you know that, there aren't issues. There's many rogue traders out there, there's people will sell anything to you if you want to buy it, and don't always be looking at what the cheapest price is, because you will pay the price for that. Okay, thanks Tony. Um, over to James, now we have uh, quite a significant lot of questions have come in, so we will try and get through as many as possible, but uh, we have 10 minutes left, so um, if I could ask you all just to keep your answers as brief as possible, but to um, so the first or another question here from Paul, wondering um, that e -tin makes perfect sense and he agrees with your positioning, just wondering why it has not happened. So can you just maybe share your thoughts on that, James? Yeah, um, I, it, simply because not much has happened at all, really. Uh, uh, Ireland has worked on complying with the uh, first version of the Renewable Energy Directive to the minimum extent possible over the last 10 years. Uh, it's just about, that's what it's doing. And you don't need to go to E10 to comply in the very minimal extent possible. Okay, um, just a, a follow on question here uh, for you, um, uh, Tony. It's around the biofuels obligation scheme certificates and is crucial to understanding and analysis of, of the business case for all renewable fuels. So. Um, what can you explain just a bit about the value of those certs and over a short or long-term period? Yeah, I suppose there are options. I suppose where this cert becomes a, a, an area of debate is when you're buying products international and the international products, you people can buy the certificate separate to the product. In other words, the sustainability does not always necessarily go with the product. In our particular instance, we sell the product as a double counted. 85% GHG saving, and we pass that cert with the product to fulfill the mandates. Distributors in Ireland and refineries in Ireland are inclined to buy it, prefer have a preferred mechanism to buy it in that manner. The value of a cert is dependent on what the, what's going on in the commodities market in general. But as such, uh, directly, we sell the product double counted. We sell the product as sustainable. So from that point of view, uh, the price is changes every single day in that regard. Okay, um, the next question here um, is uh, just regard to, from, um, regard to bi uh, production of microalgae and its use in biodiesel and bioethanol production in Ireland. And just as a follow on from that, um, I'll also maybe combine the next question as well. Uh, in terms of the treatment of the wastewater in your biodiesel and bioethanol production or manufacturing processes, so, James, maybe if you can comment on the water, how you treat your wastewater, but also the potential for microalgae. And I'll just refer briefly back to Tony on both those questions as well. Sure, okay. Well, obviously, uh, we do have uh, water, but it's, uh, it's very little. Uh, and it's also clean. Uh, I mean, the process is very clean. The water is clean. We release uh, any water that we produce out of the factory is actually cleaner than the local uh, uh, groundwater. Uh, so it's not a massive factor in it. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty clean, simple process. Um, we take everything out of the water. And microalgae, um, is it an, it's probably an area you don't have a look at. Well, microalgae falls into the category of doing uh, something in a very expensive, hard way that doesn't, isn't yet value, viable uh, compared to what we do right now. So, um, you know, we, we have uh, worked with uh, not microalgae itself, but other um, culture-based, liquid culture-based uh, mechanisms for, for producing uh, energy out of, out of light and carbon dioxide. And uh, it, it's, it's just very expensive, very risky, and um, it's kind of far in the future stuff. Uh, okay. Um, we have a climate problem today. Okay. And Tony, just would you comment on both of those as well, the microalgae and also the wastewater? Yeah, we were part of the Bantry Bay Marine Research uh, going back over the years, over the last decade. And we investigated with them under a Marie Curie EU grant to investigate how would we get on with algae in the biodiesel production. But interestingly how algae has gone is that algae can now be used as a protein supplement. So you're back into that food scenario. It has alternative uses. It's not a waste stream. 
So therefore, it has a higher value elsewhere. And similar to James, you know, it is an expensive process and it needs that added value. In relation to wastewater, as I said, we, we collect our, our, our own water from the point of view that we recycle that water in our process. We have a lot of energy efficiencies and steam recovery efficiencies to get it back. But the resultant end wastewater, uh, similar to obviously any rainwater we collect, but any wastewater we send to animal um, ABP approved biogas plants. So it still goes back into the energy sector. Okay, and um, just a question here or, or comment um, asking with the association's new invention that uses chemistry to improve the combustion efficiency of combustion ignition engines, re resulting in a primary fuel reduction of 20 to 50 percent, depending on engine size and a duty cycle, and a minimum carbon reduction of over 50 percent using your, your product. So, but look, we're willing to look at any option really that helps and assists with regard to decarbonization. Our focus obviously is on the bioenergy sector and the how bioenergy can contribute, but we're, uh, we're open to all solutions because uh, I think there is a place for all solutions. Um, just a question for, Jane, uh, for James. Um, has there been any ana analysis done, um, techno-economic analysis or assessment on the viability of him for, for ethanol production and would it be considered in the future? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, we, ana uh, we, we analyze, uh, so, you know, dozens of different uh, pathways. Uh, hemp falls into the category of making energy out of something that doesn't lend itself to, make, to, uh, 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 to energy. So, you know, if you can use the same land to produce uh, uh, plants that are rich in sugar, starch, or oil, as opposed to hemp, which is not rich in any of those, you know, hemp requires a huge amount of work to get it, uh, to turn it into a fungible form of energy that can be poured into the fuel tank of a diesel or a petrol car or petrol car. So it's, it's, it's just not viable, you, you, you know. Uh, We've been, we've been down this path and so many other companies have as well as of making liquid uh, fuels out of um, uh, plants and forms of biomass that don't yield up their energy in a liquid form very easily. And it's, you know, personally, I just say it's madness to, be, to even think about it. Why do something the hard way when there's an easy way, uh, okay. a much easier way? In terms of the Reds Directive, Jane, just to follow on for you, how has it impacted on your business model? And are there, um, in particular, what seems to be a move away from fuel crops um, and having to prove GHG emission savings? So can you just comment on that? Because I know- Well, we've no difficulty proving the GHG emission savings and they genuinely are uh, going up considerably over time. And it's a really impressive success story. Uh, that, and that's all over Europe in terms of making uh, biofuels domestically, whether it's uh, uh, diesel or bus. I mean, we, in the photograph you've seen, we have a massive big uh, biomethane plant coming on stream this year. This will replace, substitute an awful lot of the energy that we've been using already, reducing the carbon footprint of the whole plant, making it much more sustainable. Uh, so uh, GHG emissions, no problem at all. It's, it's a very rock, it's a fairly rock solid um, uh, uh, mechanism for defining those and measuring those and, and tracking them and keeping it all under control. In terms of the business model, uh, you know, red one and red two uh, were, have gone in the direction of capping uh, crop-based biofuels. Obviously, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a science-based decision. It was purely based on uh, uh, lobbying by NGOs. And uh, that's not an opinion. That's a well-established uh, uh, fact. Um, there was no need to cap it at that level, but it's done. Um, so what has it changed? Well, we, I guess people like us would have built more uh, of those brilliant uh, bioeconomy platforms uh, for producing ethanol and other things uh, than they have. So uh, that's, you know, it's a lost opportunity for us and for everybody else to do more of the same. Okay, thanks, James. We have a question here from Jerry. We, it's on HBO, so we've already kind of co covered that topic or discussed that, uh, so we won't go back on that. Um, the nutrition composition of the fertilizers the green biofuels produces, um, uh, from Jack. So, Tony, just a quick comment on that as we're coming yeah. close to the end. Overall, we have a powdered fertilizer where we recover. In Ireland, there's no pelletizing of those powders. So it goes to France and then in France, it's pelletized and brought in. The nutrition composition will be on our website under our product by, by product specs. They can see it there. But at the moment, while we looked at it, that is the, the best answer currently is sending it to Agriland in France. Um, Thanks to David for your, your feedback regarding the biofuels requirement for home eating in Northern Ireland. We just have to check that up and uh, I will come back to you. Um, 
quite a number of questions on HVO. A note here that Whitegate Refinery has co-processed it previously with fossil diesel, so it is possible in the future. Um, I might, may I, they are not. Yeah, one. just quick, yeah, quick, 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 quick. Yeah. Just think of the scale, though, of what we're competing against when it comes to HVO. It's a one million tonne plant next they have. It'd be like taking our whole refinery and say, we won't do fuel. We'll just change that over now and do, and where are the feedstocks going to come from? Yes, they did co-process before, but where are they going to get the feedstocks in the market where people are way ahead of that in that sense? And when we think the White Cage Refinery, an excellent refinery, a national treasure, and also from the point of view of its, 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 its purposes over the years, but co-processing, that word doesn't necessarily mean it's efficient energy saving content. That you would find while we're hitting 85%, a co process plant trying to put waste products through might only hit 70%, you know, very lower numbers in comparison. So we always have to drill into that detail in relation to it. So that's the only okay. comment there. Um, there's two questions here one uh, from Edgar. Um, so, in terms of bioethanol production, what are the high value products that, you're, that are refined, ref, uh, reinforced through the biorefining field? So, what, does, what are the other products, James? And we have covered on the ligno uh, cellulosis bio refining yeah. but it maybe give we, we've actually covered that at the start because you give your views on that so just a quick one there james on the um high value products produced through the bio refining process but also if you could comment on um the question here again how are biofuels aligned uh for the ev scope how does this the two approaches support each other uh in terms of evs and and, and biofuels so if you could comment james on both of those Okay, EV scope, yeah, we need both. Uh, you know, even when we've got a million EVs on Irish roads, which I hope happens very soon, we'll still have uh, between two and three million uh, conventional vehicles. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a profile or picture that we'll see for a few decades more. It's not just a few years more. So they're completely complementary. There's no competition between electromobility and biofuels whatsoever. We need them both. Okay. Um, in Sorry. terms of the high value co-products, well, you know, what goes into a plant like ours is a grain, of, a plant grain that's comprised of starch, uh, fiber, protein, and oil. So the starch goes into the biofuel and then the fiber, the protein, and the oil, we separate them out and uh, we do a number of different things. So we've got a number of different grades of protein animal feed, very high protein, uh, GMO-free, antibiotic-free, uh, animal feed and that is a high value brand we call it Pannonia Gold like Kerrygold it's a, a, we, uh, it's a very consistent high quality product and that's as, as important to us as the energy because animals got to eat that stuff it has to be very good for them they have to like it it has to be consistent we have different grades of fiber coming out and we're processing them into new products that we hope to be launching in the next couple of years and then we have very high, we have high value um, uh, oil as well we're even integrating up, up at the front end into other ways of, of, uh, whereby we take starch out of other types of grains, we put that into the system, improve, improving the overall efficiency and then what isn't, uh, and then using the proteins and oils we're getting out from those other crops going into the process. You know, we think that in another few years, half our revenues will be high value uh, new products, uh, that there's massive growth there. So it's a bioeconomy story, and it's the it's the poster child of bioeconomy uh, uh, success in Europe. It's just phenomenally okay. inspiring. And we had a question there, a comment uh, about the whole um, fuel, fuel versus fuel debate and discussion that. So I think you you touched on some of those areas. Unfortunately, we don't have time to maybe explore that in further detail. Um, so, and James, just uh, you're looking for information, we, we'll, we'll get in touch after the, the webinar with you as well around that. So I think that really kind of most of the topics, I know we might have come addressed everyone's question individually, but we have, we have definitely focused on the topics which have featured heavily uh, right through the, the discussion. I apologize if we haven't got to everyone's feedback um, but, uh, we, and if you have any specific queries that you'd like to pose, uh, to each of the speakers or panelists, um, if you can email them directly to myself, uh, it's Sean S E A N F I N A N at I R B E A dot org, um, and we'd be happy to take them. Um, I'd like to thank James. I'd like to thank Tony, um, and I'd like to thank Noel. Um, I'm sorry, Noel, I didn't get a chance to bring you in more. Uh, the topics were quite specific to the two speakers, so they obviously uh, it turned up quite a, a lot of interest in, in on the particular technologies. So, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Teresa O'Brien 
who behind the scenes made all this possible today um, uh, from the technology perspective, but also to advertising the event. Our next webinar, as I said, will take place on the 22nd of July, which is this day two weeks from um, 9.30, uh, to 10 30. Uh, we're just finalizing the topic uh, but it will be on the on the bioenergy sector and um, we're varying the topics across all the various sectors and if there are any attendees or any members um, we are open to showcasing members as part of this webinar series and we're, 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 we're grateful that um, Tony and James as both members of the Irish Bioenergy Association took time out this morning to uh, participate but if there are any members that would like to, con to take part feel free to get in touch. And so that really concludes uh, this morning's webinar. Thank you all uh, very much for attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.